Baptist Day worship service. My name is John Klein, and we are glad to have you with us. We will be watching a couple of Father's Day videos today, as well as a video from a new father, Edson Casanella, speaking to us from Angola. And so joining me on the platform today will be on piano, Zach Lim, on drums, Shan, uh, not Shannon, Shannon will be singing, but on drums, it will be Graham Robertson, Shannon Robertson will be singing, and Cetri Jivenu will now come and share some announcements. So again, happy Father's Day to our fathers, to our grandfathers, our great-grandfathers. Today, we just so you know, we love you, and God richly bless you for all you do. So just to bring you to speed to some of the things happening in the church, just so you know, the adult Sunday school class ended today uh, for the summer. Uh, the children's Sunday school class will end next week. So pretty much all the continuing Christian education programs are over at uh, this month, and we uh, pray that you have a restful uh, summer season. Uh, I just also want to mention that during our service today, we will be having a time of prayer and we we'll also want you to be part of it. So send us your prayer requests, your praise reports, and uh, you can do so to our church website uh, platform, which is the WhatsApp platform, McLaurin Prayer Wall. Uh, just send those details there. But if you don't have, or you're not currently on that platform, you can also text your uh, request to us uh, via the, uh, the telephone number you see on your screen. Uh, going forward, uh, this being the last month of our church year, we'll also be having our year-end congregational meeting, and that's going to be via Zoom. We practiced it the last time. It went pretty much well, so we're going to be doing that again. So it's going to be a virtual meeting, and we encourage all of you to come. We will be sending you the Zoom link uh, this week, and this week, uh, during that meeting, we'll be taking reports from uh, the pastoral team and uh, board leadership as well as be uh, talking a uh, certain budget for our new year. So we ask that you make time to be part of that very special meeting. So that's all the announcements for this morning, and I pray that you enjoy God's presence even as we worship together. this day for our dads. Thank you for our fathers. We know that you are the one to whom we should look for the perfect father. You love us and you protect us. You provide for us. You advocate for us. You delight in us. You give us yourself without reservation, completely. 
We delight as we become more and more and more what you have called us to be. Father, we know that good dads look to you for continually refilling the reservoir of love that good dads need to keep on loving their children. So, Father, we pray this day for all the fathers that they would look to you, that they would not try to be fathers in their own strength, because we know whatever it is we do in our own strength, we fail at miserably. And with fatherhood, those failures do not stay with us, but the effects go out into the world to children. And so, Father, this day, we thank you for our dads, and we pray that they would be encouraged and they would be empowered. We lift them up to you, fill them, renew them, let them know that it is you that they should look to, and you will give them everything they need. Thank you. This Father's Day, you are our good, good Father. And we delight in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh. 
from Angola, Edson Casanella, from our congregation, who is from Brazil, but is now in Angola, will be sharing video greetings with us at this time. God bless you, Edson. video to come up, I will tell you that Edson moved to Canada and then back to Brazil. He and his wife had a baby boy. And then Edson, for work purposes, went to Angola. And it was in Angola that he became stuck during COVID-19. So separated from his wife and child, separated from here, where they would all like to be. And so Edson has sent these video greetings. We have done some closed captioning on it so that we can all read and hear. So we're waiting for the video greetings. We'll just do a time of prayer. And so I will pray for Edson at this time, and then we will watch his video as we can get it up. Gracious Lord, we are thankful for Edson. We are thankful, Lord, that you have been with him and his family, that you have been blessing them at this time. And so, Lord, we thank you that they are living in a day and age of being able to communicate via communications such as FaceTime, such as Zoom, in whatever way. And so, Lord, we ask your blessing upon Edson, upon his wife, and upon this child at this time. Bless them and meet all their needs. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll watch this video from Edson. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our world community is facing an unparalleled time of stress which as we face the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sending this message from Angola. I left my wife and little baby in Brazil. They are fine. Unfortunately, I can't go back now. I have to wait until the end of the lockdown. Dear my Glory Baptist Church family, Lord, teach us to number our days. That is the prayer of the psalmist who in difficult times exhorts the pursuit of wisdom and perspective which involves honest reflections about life and its currently harsh circumstances and he also pleads for the Lord his God to rescue him and his people. To gain a wise perspective we have to face our fears. We must face those days of fears and testing. This can and should be days of renewed worship, rededicated service, care, friendship, work and love. We must love one another and be kind to one another as God in Christ has been merciful to us. I hope that we are going to meet as soon as possible and uh, Thank you so much. We are thankful for all those around the world in our church diaspora who are sending us video greetings. And we hope to be able to continue with this. We know that many of you have commented on what a blessing it is to see our brothers and sisters around the world. And so let's remember those in the diaspora at this moment. And then, as you can, send in prayer, requests, and praises onto our WhatsApp on your cell phones, and we will pray through them. So, gracious Lord, we thank you for our diaspora, our church family throughout the world. 
We thank you, Lord, for all those, for all those who have sent us video greetings and who are waiting, waiting to return back to Canada. And so we ask your blessing upon them. We pray for the families to be united. And we pray that in the meantime, as they are waiting physical reunion, that they will be spiritually and relationally united. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless all those from our church family who are away at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so, Lord, we also want to pray for uh, those in the media team, those that make it possible for us to be able to uh, uh, worship every Sunday. Uh, this morning, we want to thank you for Olu, uh, Olabintem, Tinu Olabintem, and Duncan Robertson who are working so hard with such alertness to be sure that we, everything that's going out is accurate. And Father, we just want to thank you for their dedication and for their service. And we pray for your blessing upon them, even as they give off of their time and their skills and talents. Bless them, and we pray that you'll bless their ministry in many ways, and that we can reach the ends of the earth for you. Father, we want to thank you again for these gifts and for this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, we lift up all of those who are fatherless in our society. We know that there are so many whose father was there at the very beginning and hasn't been there since. There is an absent place where a father should be. Or for so many, there is an improvident, cruel father where a loving father should be. So many of us have had a sense of fatherhood twisted. Father, said it right. You are our good father, and we can all turn to you and have that need for a good father completely satisfied. This is our prayer this day, that we would all look to you, because we know that you are perfect and able to be our good father. This is our prayer this day. And so, Lord, we I continue this morning to thank you for Kim. We thank you for the recovery, albeit uh, slowly and painfully. We are so thankful that the surgery uh, that was done uh, to, on her liver, uh, it's, it's, in, it's in progress. And, but we also this morning just want to pray that you will perfect this healing. As we thank you for this, we also ask the Lord you bring to a full completion, a full healing, full recovery for him, uh, for Kim. We lift her to you this, this day. Amen. And Lord, we pray for Robert Snyder, Shannon's brother. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, that you've brought him through this difficult year of physical challenges. And so, Lord, we thank you that you have been working in his body. And so in this latest bout, it's of shingles, Lord, we thank you that you've brought him through this. You were bringing him through this. So we pray for much improvement for that and for complete healing and for his other medical challenges as well. We also thank you, Lord, that he is spiritually growing. Bless him, Lord, and bring him fully into your fold as he gives his life over to you totally. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Father, we lift up prayers for Vincent, your son, a pastor, Professor in Sri Lanka, you know that Vincent just had surgery and we pray that you would have your healing hand on him, and that his healing would be perfect and complete, that you would keep him safe from infection, that you would keep his spirits buoyant, and that he would testify to the glory and the goodness of God in his life. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we also want to thank you for those that celebrated their birthdays this week. Sean Robertson, Diana Kitchirk. Father, we and uh, Ali Bender, we want to really thank you for their lives and we pray that Lord you will bless them. Even as they uh, begin a new year, we ask that Lord they will continue to uh, find you in every way that they are needing you. We pray also pray that Lord they will continue to increase in you. And so we pray for your blessings upon them. We pray for good health. And we pray that laughter will fill their homes. We pray that good health will be their portion. And we pray that this time next year, we will rejoice again with them because of the great things you have done. In Jesus' name, amen.
And Lord, we thank you for those who have been teaching Sunday school. And we thank you, Lord, for their dedication to this task. And so, Lord, we ask you to bless all those who have been leading, but particularly we pray uh, for Stephen Shodapo, your blessing upon him, and Ken Bender, as well as Tim Davidson and Rain Mayer, also a birthday girl this week. And so, Lord, we thank you for these four people and the others who have helped them. Mm -hmm. We thank you, Lord, for them. And we ask you to bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, I lift up my coworker, Jasmine. Jasmine is having surgery this Friday, and it is it will be a life-altering procedure. She's anxious. She doesn't know you. And so, Father, I pray that the surgery would go well and that she would have an extraordinary sense of peace and calm, that she would not know why it is except that you are with her. We pray for the doctors. We pray for Jasmine. Pray for you to draw this woman to yourself. We give you all honor and glory and praise. All healing is from you. All healing is from you. We thank you. We look to you to provide in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Father, on a note of praise, we also want to thank you for the over 800 different men from 10 countries uh, who participated in some way in uh, the Resort Ministries 14-day of the Roof Pond Free Challenge. Father, we thank you that these men want to live lives of freedom, purity, and integrity. Lord, this morning our prayer is the Lord, you will grant them power, strength, and victories in your gracious name. And again, we also want to thank you for Matt Klein's ministry in this regard. Bless this ministry and let you reach more men for you. In Jesus' name. And Lord, as we do a full circle coming back to our diaspora, spread around the world, we pray for all those who want to come back to Canada. And so we know that immediately, Chi, Chinieri, and Setri, Chi and her children, their children, that they want to come back from Kenya for a visit this summer. So we ask, Lord, that you would make that happen, that you would provide that way. And Lord, we lift up all of these and our other prayer requests to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as we begin our Father's Day, we want to encourage you to keep on sending in prayer requests and we can pray them as we go through our service. I want to begin with a story for the sermon. There was a family who had three small children who really, really wanted a puppy, a puppy dog. The children nagged their mother day after day, please, can we have a puppy? Please, mom, please. The mother did not want a puppy. With everything she already did in the house, she knew that she would be the one who would end up looking after the puppy. But the children promised that it would be them who would look after the puppy. They would feed it. They would walk it. They would wash it. They would train it. Being a loving mother, she gave in, and the next day she went and bought a puppy. The three children were all excited, and they named the puppy Danny. As promised, they'd, they took care of Danny, at least at first. But as the days went by, Mom found herself being the only one taking care of the dog. It became all too much for her. So the mother began to look for a new home for Danny, the puppy dog. When she found one, she told the children, Danny will have to go. The mom was a little surprised by the lack of sadness from her children. No tears, no protests, no complaints. One of them just said, oh, well, we will miss him. I'm sure we will, the mother said, but he is too much work for one person. And since I'm the one who does all the work, I say he goes. Then one of the other children asked, what if he didn't eat so much or if he wasn't so messy, could we keep him? 
Mom held her ground and said, it's time to take Danny to his new home. Suddenly, with one voice and with tears in their eyes, the children exclaimed, Danny, we thought you said Daddy. Note that the children loved their dog Danny more than they did their daddy. On the church blog this week, I quoted numerous people on the role of fathers. For example, former American President Barack Obama stated that the biggest reason for the troubles in America in the inner cities is the number of fatherless families. Obama claimed that children get into gangs, drop out of school, boys get girls pregnant or end up in prison, most because, mostly because their fathers have abandoned them or had such a negative role in their lives that the kids act out. Not to dismiss or minimize the role of the mother at all, but children need a present and good father, according to Barack Obama and others. Now in the Bible, different fathers are portrayed as good or bad, wise or foolish, kind or jealous, but they are always presented as essential to the well-being of their children. As we have preached through the book of Psalms these past few months, we have seen that King David was the most prolific of all the psalm writers, and he was unmatched in his poetic ability to tap into God's heart. But here is the thing on this Father's Day. David struggled with being a good dad. In fact, he failed miserably in that role, as we will see today. The Bible is very practical and plain, often disturbingly so for us who are reading it, because it records the weaknesses of so many of the heroes of the Bible, and in this case, the many weaknesses of this most beloved king of Israel. So as we begin today's look at David the father, we need to hear first that God had centuries before warned the Israelites that when they entered the promised land, the king must not take many wives or his, his heart will be led astray. So no king of Israel was to have more than one wife. So how did David do with that one commandment of God's, as well as others, such as those in the more well-known Ten Commandments? We will come back to that, but, but the answer is not so well as it turned out. For instance, we read that one time when the Israelite army had gone off to war against their enemy, David, as their commander-in-chief who was supposed to have gone with them, decided to stay home. Now by this time, you need to know that in his life he had already taken seven women as wives. Seven. So on that fateful day when he was whiling away his free time while his soldiers were off fighting for their nation, David went out on the rooftop palace, rooftop terrace of his palace. It was the highest spot in Jerusalem. And at that time, it was common practice for people to bathe on their flat rooftops. So there David was out on his flat rooftop terrace when he looked over the wall and he spotted on another lower rooftop a gorgeous lady bathing on her own rooftop. And David was consumed with lust in order that the lady Bathsheba be brought to him. Once in his presence, Bathsheba tried to convince David to not proceed with his lustful desires for her, but he persisted, and Bathsheba became pregnant. And when David learned this, he panicked, for he realized that people would be able to figure out that he was the father of Bathsheba's child because everyone knew that Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was away fighting in the battle against Israel's enemy. Planning quickly... David brought Uriah home in the hopes that he, Uriah, would have sexual relations with his wife. And if Uriah did, then it might be that everyone would think Bathsheba's baby was Uriah's. Uriah, though, being an honorable man, refused to indulge, knowing how unfair it would be for him to be having such pleasure while his fellow soldiers were out fighting for Israel. David, by now in full panic mode, sent Uriah back to the battlefield, with secret orders to the military leaders to send Uriah to the front lines of the battle where the fighting would be the most fierce. And once there, the orders were for his fellow soldiers to draw back in order to leave poor Uriah fighting the enemy all on his own. 
The instructions were followed and Uriah was killed by the opposing forces, just as David had hoped. David thought that his secret sins were safe, but God, who has an annoying way of doing such things, revealed David's sins to the prophet Nathan, who then confronted David, forewarning him that his sins would result in troubles and warfare within his household for the rest of his life. So, four universal laws of God had been violated by King David. First, the king having not more than one wife, and then three from the Ten Commandments, no adultery, no murder, and no coveting of one's neighbor's wife. Now, the child David had with Bathsheba would end up dying, and David would then take the widow Bathsheba as his eighth wife, and they had another son who they named Solomon. And Solomon would end up being the successor to David, the next king of Israel, handpicked by David. But before that happened, we need to understand that there were many interactions with his eight wives and 19 sons, as well as his daughters, and that they weren't good interactions. David, as a husband and a father, was remarkable only for his absenteeism. He was a bad husband and a lousy father. Remember, God had warned David and the other kings that having more than one wife would result in grave trouble. And so we read that first Amnon, David's eldest son and thus, thus the natural successor to his throne, was murdered by his stepbrother, David's third-born son, Absalom. Amnon's death meant that there was no clear successor to the throne. And so we read that secondly, David's life led to a life of outright mocking of him and rebellion against him by his wives and children, just as the prophet Nathan had foretold. This was made all the more potent by the jockeying for power that went on after Amnon's death. Think about this, eight wives, 19 sons, the natural successor dead, no other son named at that time as David's successor. So each wife thus promoted one of her own sons to be the king's successor. The internal family fighting for the position of David's successor was intense. Jealousy and hatred and jockeying for position abounded. We also read that third, after Amnon's death, King David went into mourning for him, and Absalom, the son, the murder of the son, David, was in deep mourning for Amnon. Absalom re realized that he was in trouble with his father. And thus we read that. Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without coming into the king's presence. However, in those two years, Absalom realized that David was not going to punish him for murdering Amnon. And so Absalom became cocky, and he misread David's inaction as weakness. And thus forth, Absalom conspired to overthrow his father as king and take over the role of king of Israel for himself. And so, turning to the Bible now, we read about his conspiracy to overthrow King David. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot and horses, and with 50 men to run ahead of him. Then Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom king in he is king in Hebron. 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. And so the conspiracy gained strength, and Absalom's following kept on increasing. This was all being done in secret. Absalom had gone to Hebron, this other city, established that as his center during this time of overthrow. overthrow. But the people of Israel began to gather behind Absalom and they, because they perceived David to be a weakling. But Absalom's secret plot to overthrow David leaked out. A messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us, and put the city to the sword. 
So David and his followers fled Jerusalem. However, David had said to them, If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says, I am not pleased with you, then I am ready. Let him do to me whatever he's, he seems good to him. Now, you may remember, and this may be confusing to you, the famous words God had earlier said about David, that he was a man after his own heart. In light of what we have read so far about David, and what we know about him, a lousy father, a terrible husband, and a sinner, in what way could David be considered by God to be a man after his own heart? Well, before we answer that question, let's first return to the story of David fleeing from his son Absalom. And in doing so, let us recognize that three of David's psalms are historically connected with that time of his fleeing from his son Absalom. So traditions are strong that David, while in flight from Absalom, comforted and emboldened himself by reading over and over again to himself two of his own earlier psalms, Psalms 70 and 71. So first, let's hear Psalm 70. Hasten, O God, to save me. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. May those who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, turn back because of their shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for you, for your saving, for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. But as for me, I am poor and needy. Come quickly to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. Lord, do not delay. So Psalm 70, those were words that strengthened and comforted David. And here's Psalm 71. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, rescue me and deliver me. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. Give the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of those who are evil and cruel, for you have been my hope. Sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. I will proclaim your righteousness deeds, yours alone. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. Psalm 71. At the end of this psalm, because David had earlier seen God deliver him from King Saul and other enemies who were trying to kill him, at that time, David had confidently stated, My leaves will shout for joy when I sing praise to you, I whom you have delivered. My tongue will tell of your righteous acts all day long. For those who wanted to harm me have been put to shame and confusion. So apparently, David read those two psalms to himself over and over again as he was fleeing from Absalom. But we also know that he wrote a psalm, Psalm 3, during that time of trouble. The introduction of Psalm 3 states that it is a psalm of David when he had fled from his son Absalom. And so here are the words that David wrote at that troubled time, Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are my shield around me. My glory, the one who lifts up my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though ten thousands, tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me. My God, strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. Again, before we answer the question of how David could be described by God as a man after my own heart, and before we find out how the story of David fleeing from Absalom ended, let's turn to Jesus' famous parable of the prodigal son. In that parable, Jesus describes a certain father who had two sons. 
The younger son was disrespectful of his father and demanded of him his full inheritance. Now in Israel, the inheritance was only given after a father died, but this son demanded, I want what is mine now. And in effect, it was the son saying to the father, I wish you were dead. The heartbroken father gave over to his son his inheritance. Jesus doesn't say how long it took, but the son's inherited money ran out, squandered on wild living and prostitutes. In order to make ends meet, the son, a Jewish boy, took a job feeding pigs in a pig pen, working with animals disgusting to good Jews. Jesus says of that young man, He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to, his, to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best rope and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. So they began to celebrate. When the father saw the son returning, he ran to him. No matter how poorly the son had treated him. And in the parable, the father wrapped his arms around the son. And Jesus described the father as representing God. And the prodigal person, the prodigal son, any person who has turned from him. So this parable in Luke 15 is a picture of God's own heart. Now about God the Father having that kind of heart, we read words from yet another of his psalms, words from King David in Psalm 103. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who honor him. So returning now to the story of David and his son Absalom, David still loved Absalom even after he had sought to overthrow and kill David, his father. We read that David took one last stab at trying to convince Absalom to, as had been true with the prodigal son, come to his senses. David wanted to go out and reason with Absalom, but his military officials would not agree to that. Instead, they left David where he was, and they went out, led by David's military commander, Joab, who ended up, killing Absalom. Meanwhile, back at his waiting place, David longed for word about the battle, and he saw a man running to him, a messenger, as that was how news was passed on back at the time. A messenger from the scene would come running with news. And so when the messenger arrived, David asked about Absalom, hoping for the best for his son. But that first messenger was not forthcoming about what had happened. So seeing a second messenger coming running, a man from the nation of Cush, David dismissed the first messenger. Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord and the king, may the enemies of my lord the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like the, that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. And he went, as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. David's desire to be a good father was too late. But here is where all the strands of this sermon come together. David had a heart after God's own heart in that he longed to be reconciled to his son, to have a relationship with him. The father and the father 
in the parable of the prodigal son longed to be reconciled to his son, to have a relationship with him. God longs to be reconciled with his sons and daughters to have a relationship with them, with us. Now, a few stories match the gripping grief of the father David when he heard the death of his son Absalom. For David knew that it was his own sins that had led to Absalom's rebellion and ultimate death. So in conclusion, fathers, parents, uncles, everyone, what can we learn from this sad look at the bad fathering of King David? First thing we can learn is that the sins of husbands and fathers can bring sorrow to their families. I read once about a small Scottish village where stores had been broken into by some youths and damage done on a Saturday night spree of destruction. One of the older men in the town, it seems, darted out of his house with a big stick to chase off the offending youths, but he was too late. They were gone. He decided to follow their trail. He saw all the signs of their presence, noted all of the damage they had done along their path of destruction. He followed their tracks closely and eventually came to the house where the tracks of the hooligans ended and he froze for it was his own house. He recognized at that point that his sons were the hooligans and he realized what a bad father he had been. You see, children follow us on the paths we take. So parents, fathers, let's make sure that we are going on the right path ourselves. Please focus your eyes on Jesus and follow his way. And if you are up on a rooftop you should not be on, get off it. And focus your eyes on the way on which the Lord would have you go. Secondly, the holy love of our Heavenly Father will never end. It's a lesson to know. Friends, God the Father is ready to run to you, to hug and embrace and affirm you. Imagine his arms around you. You don't have to be perfect for him to do so, but you do need to turn back to him, to come to your senses. And when you are in the place you should be, and walking on the path you should be walking on, it will be a good thing. And your family will be blessed. And your legacy of integrity will reap many good things. So friends, live your life for Jesus, walking after him. And you will see his blessings fall on you and on your family. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we pray for our society at this time, that our society will turn to you. We think of the turmoil in the West, really around the world, as the chaos and division is so rampant. We look at the economic impact of the pandemic and how it has impacted lives and taken away hope. And so may our response be, as you would have it be, that we would share about God the Father, the one who loves and gives life. And may our resolve deepen in turning to you and following after you and in sharing the truth about Jesus, the hope of the world. So come, Lord, and heal hearts and heal our land. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In conclusion, we will sing the love of God and turn your eyes upon Jesus, and then we will have a short Father's Day benediction. God bless you this week.
Now, as you go into your world, may you love your children, but God loves his children. May you find your identity in being a son of the only perfect Father. May you make it possible, make it impossible for your daughters to ever find a husband as good as their dad. May you teach your children that their mother is the most beautiful woman alive. She's really pretty. May you risk more, worry less, and play hard. May you lead your family, not as a king, but as a servant. Who protects their hearts, protects their hearts. May you laugh at the little things, the little things. And finally, and finally, may you lay down your life for your family. And may you introduce them to God 
to a God that's already done that exact thing. We hope that you have a great day today. Great day today. Have a great day today. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day.